Deputy Clerk, former President of South Africa, and the current Chairman of the Global Leadership Foundation. Uh, there are very few world leaders whose actions on the world stage exemplify the potential impact of dialogue and understanding and cooperation, which we try to emphasize here at the Center, uh, better than our guest. Uh, Fifteen years ago, uh, President de Klerk's leadership of South Africa culminated in the country's first democratic elections and the end of apartheid. His accomplishments extend far beyond, of course, the events of 1994. When he became president in 1989, after 11 years as a cabinet minister, with portfolios covering environmental planning, national education, sports and recreation, among others, he inherited South Africa's clandestinely built nuclear arsenal. He became the first world leader to voluntarily disarm. He told Newsweek in 2006, quote, I wanted South Africa to return as soon as possible to the international arena, and I wanted to convince the rest of the world that we really were not playing with words. We really were prepared to undertake negotiations which would result in fundamental change, end of quote. Fundamental change is exactly what President de Klerk brought to South Africa. He released, as you all know, Nelson Mandela from prison, ended the ban on the African National Congress, paved the way for a more just society. In 1993, he and President Mandela received the Nobel Peace Prize and the Philadelphia Peace Prize in recognition of their work. Following Mandela's election, President de Klerk served as one of two South Africa's uh, two ex one of South Africa's two executive deputy presidents until 1996. He retired from politics in September 1997. In the year 2000, he founded the F. W. de Klerk Foundation, which is dedicated to the promotion of peace in multicommunal societies. That same year he published his autobiography, The Last Trek, A New Beginning. In 2004, he established the Global Leadership Foundation, of which he is chairman. The GLF brings together some of the finest world leaders, including former Canadian Prime Minister and Wilson Center scholar Joe Clark, Ambassador John Danforth, Jordan's Prince El Hassan bin Talal. The purpose, of course, to promote peace, democracy, and development. Born in Johannesburg, President de Klerk received his BA and LLB degrees from Potchefstroom University for Christian Higher Education. He was first elected to Parliament in 1972. Uh, he and his wife, Alida, who could not be with us this morning, live outside Cape Town. I understand that they have recently ventured on an enterprise almost as complicated as peacemaking, and that's winemaking. Uh, but they are withdrawing from the winemaking business, uh, and we all know, of course, that South Africa produces uh, some marvelous wines. President de Klerk, we look forward to your comments. We're delighted to have you here at the center. He will speak for a few minutes, uh, then uh, we'll have a session of questions and answers, uh, moderated by Steve McDonald. Uh, President. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for a gracious introduction. I have some enemies which would have introduced me quite differently. <laughs> I'm glad that you got the favorable curriculum vitae. <laughs> It's good to be here. Uh, this institute is doing wonderful work. I've just been reminded of some very prominent South Africans uh, who participated here, who came here, who studied here, who uh, contributed to the scholarship uh, activities which take place at this institute. It's a great honor to be here today. I'm not going to make a, a big speech. I really prefer Q&A 
because then we really get to the issues which uh, are foremost in the mind of the members of the audience, and I don't bore you with what might, well, with what might be in the foremost of my mind. So let me restrict my opening remarks to three things. First, just to make the point that looking at the world, and that is why I started the Global Leadership Foundation, while globalization is benefiting the greatest part of the world, one-third of the world population still live in abject poverty, are subject to all sorts of oppression, are living in dire circumstances. Human rights is for them something they don't know about. The health situation is terribly bad. Standards of government in the underdeveloped and in many parts of the developing world is way below where it should be. And the gap is growing. The gap between the successful countries and the emerging countries which are on the right road and those who are still sort of caught up in their poverty and in their dire circumstances is growing, it is not narrowing. And therefore, we decided in the Global Leadership Foundation to dedicate ourselves to provide discreet and confidential advice to leaders in government in the developing world on governance issues. What we bring to the table is good experience of governance. We do it not for profit, and we do it with discretion and confidentiality because there's a loss of face for leaders if you come in and say you need good advice if you ride in like the knight on the white horse and say with two TV crews, I'm here to help you. We leave it in the hands of the leaders that we advise to what extent they wish to disclose that they are interacting with us. We're not a secret organization. Therefore, I cannot tell you where we are involved uh, in detail because I would break the confidentiality. But we are involved in about five countries in Africa at the moment. We're involved in Southeast Asia. We're involved in the Middle East, not in Israel and Palestine. There are too many fingers in that pie already. They don't need an extra finger. We are uh, involved in uh, also in a country in Asia. We are near to getting deeply involved there. And there are quite a number of other projects all over the world in the pipeline. The second caption under which I would like to just make a few comments is Africa. I'm an African, and I try to help to dispense with some of the wrong perceptions about Africa. Afro-pessimism is hurting Africa. Africa is doing better than the general impression is. Yes. There are many countries which, uh, which are dealing with their population in a totally unacceptable way. There are undemocratic countries. There are dictatorships. There are countries in which the gross violations of human rights take place daily, by the hour, by the minute. But there are now more democracies in Africa than there were 10 years ago. There are more sort of emerging democracies than they were 10 years ago. And there are substantially less dictatorships and countries in which oppression is the rule. Freedom House has made, uh, uh, I don't have the exact figures with me, Freedom House in London has published recently on this, and it is clear that it is improving. Economically, the growth rates in Africa have risen. It was helped along by new discoveries of oil and some minerals in some parts, but somehow or another things are improving. But the one area where Africa can and might become a bit more competitive is agriculture. And there the Northern Hemisphere, America, the European Union, 
needs to do more to give access to agricultural products from Africa. The rich part of the world spends five times as much as they give to aid to Africa, five times more to their farmers in subsidies. Something is definitely wrong somewhere if that is the situation. I believe from an African perspective that uh, the institution of NAPAD was a good development, that it's a good approach for Africa to admit that the primary responsibility to get its house in order lies on the African leaders themselves. But they need help, and therefore they have undertaken to, through peer review and <clears throat> other ways, to improve the situation. They have accepted a value system of democracy is the best system, of the need for well-balanced economic policies, of the need for strengthening the rule of law. The leading countries of the world and with America as still the, the real leading country of the world really needs to help develop this concept into something dynamic which can achieve results in Africa. This partnership is essential and I'm making a plea that it should be strengthened and it should have the support of the international community. Then lastly, South Africa. I'm proudly South African. Things are going reasonably well in South Africa. On the economic side, our Minister of Finance, the longest serving Minister of Finance in the world at the moment, delivered his 13th budget, assured the people of South Africa and the rest of the world that we will be able to avoid recession, although we will obviously also suffer as a result of the present economic, uh, international, global situation, but that we will still have in 2009 positive growth. He's predicting, I think, 1,2%. <coughs> On the political side, we're going through a turbulent period. Can I just have a bit of water, please? We're going through a difficult period in the sense that... Uh, the, uh, the ruling party has had a sort of an internal upheaval. It's not bad for the country and democracy because a democracy which is wonderful on paper as we have in our good constitution uh, is not a very healthy democracy if one party holds 70% of the vote and if all the other parties compete for the 30%. With the split which occurred in the ANC now, there is, I think, a possibility, a reasonable, strong possibility, that the ANC will be brought beneath the two-thirds majority which they have at the moment, <coughs> which I believe is, is good for the system in South Africa. It gives a feeling of security about the Constitution. I also think it will make our party political system more competitive. But I do predict there will be further splits not before the election of 22nd of April, but afterwards. Because you have united in the ANC alliance, people who really believe with regard to some issues in opposite things which strive for opposite goals. You still have people who really believe in communism. You have in the ANC alliance people who are strong supporters of far-left socialism. You have pragmatists. You have people who believe in f the free market. And they all together, and somehow or another, South Africa's democracy will only become whole and healthy and dynamic once we move away from old historical differences, once we move away from ethnically based and ethnically driven politics towards value based and policy-driven party politics. It will happen. I can't predict exactly when it will happen. But in the meantime, we have had, and we're proud of it, we have had 
in 94, in 99, in 2004, and we're going to have in 2009 free and fair and peaceful elections. We've had from two presidents peaceful handover of power to a successor. This is all good news if you look at it at the background of what has happened in so many countries in Africa. We've had adherence to the two-term uh, for a president provision in our constitution. But, and I will sit down with this, our constitution is in a sense under threat. I must immediately say the ANC has stuck to its word and I honor them for that. Although they have the capacity to uh, amend the constitution, they never used their majority. The risk for the Constitution lies more in the incorrect interpretation of the Constitution by Parliament. There's an, a tendency to elevate some of the rights ensconced in the Constitution to primary rights and to relegate some of the other rights to secondary rights. And this is not what was agreed. What was agreed in this compromise which is encapsulated in the Constitution is that all the rights there are equal rights. And therefore any interpretation of it must be done so that seemingly conflicting provisions will be interpreted in balance with each other. Let me give you one example of seemingly conflicting provisions. One of the departure points is there shall not be discrimination on the basis of race, on the basis of ethnicity, on the basis of gender, on the basis of religion, or whatever other basis. But there is a provision which says there is something like fair discrimination in order to rectify the wrongs of the past. And therefore, black economic empowerment it, although it's a form of discrimination, will, will, is acceptable and therefore affirmative action is acceptable. And I support that and I still support that today. But the way then in which affirmative action and black economic empowerment takes place must never violate that basic departure point of no discrimination is allowed. It must be done in a balanced way. And it is for this reason, not about this specific issue, this tendency to, to change the balance which is contained within the Constitution that I established a Center for Constitutional Rights. We employ two counsel full time. We monitor all bills which come before Parliament for its constitutionality. We're not confrontational. If we find that there is something unconstitutional in prospective legislation, we enter into dialogue with the government, we enter into dialogue with parliamentary committees. But if need be, if an important principle comes to the fore, we will not hesitate, and we have done so on one occasion, to go to the Constitutional Court in order to get an authoritative interpretation of what is constitutional and what is not. But by and large, it's going well in South Africa. There's a positive spirit. The overwhelming majority of all South Africans, irrespective of party affiliation, irrespective of race or color, want the new South Africa to succeed and are anxious and prepared to take hands over old divisions, across old divisions, in order to ensure that South Africa reaches its full capacity. It is destined to play an ever-growing pivotal role in sub-Sahara Africa. We are ready and able to play that role, but we don't want to play that role in South Africa, as South Africa in, in a sort of a big brother way. We want to do it in a way of inclusivity and therefore within the framework of the African Union. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I look forward to your questions, and I'll try to give you honest answers. Uh, thank you, President Clerk. That was uh, 
very interesting and enlightening, uh, and you touched on many subjects. Uh, as we turn it over to questions, I am sure that uh, uh, there will be a range of questions from the internal situation in South Africa now, the politics leading up to the coming election in April, and uh, and also to your role during that transition of 1989 to 1994. Um, uh, I want to remind the audience uh, of the culture here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, when you raise your hand and I recognize you for a question, a microphone will be brought to you because this is being recorded, so wait for that microphone. When you get the microphone, please identify yourself and in your institution. So we'll have that on record. I think we'll probably bundle two or three questions together uh, for the president so that he can handle them uh, uh, at the same time, and I think we maybe we'll save some time that way. Um, but I'm going to use the prerogative of the chair to ask the first question. Uh, I, I've got a feeling that there will probably be an awful lot of, uh, of attention uh, to the, uh, the transition uh, period uh, from apartheid South Africa to the new South Africa and, and on current politics in South Africa. So, Mr. President, I would like to follow up on, uh, on your uh, words about the um, uh, Global Leadership Foundation. And, and just see, uh, because in the Africa Bureau here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, we're, we're looking at the whole continent, just see where you think uh, the key governance problems that are facing Africa lie. And, and by that I mean either within an issue of electoral uh, procedures uh, uh, or also <coughs> specific countries. Uh, what lies before us in this next year or two? And I'm asking you this question partially because I'd love to have you outline that as we're going into a new administration here in the United States and we're thinking through policy options. Maybe I should start out by saying I think it's not an unfair statement to make to say that America, the European Union, and many other leading countries really don't have a cohesive policy with regard to Africa. Mm. And I think there's a great need for the G7 and the G8 to develop a cohesive approach. There is a threat in the form of China, which has a cohesive policy for Africa which is moving into Africa in, in an unprecedented way. They have a right to do so. They have a right to secure their access to basic minerals and materials and what Africa can offer to them. But somehow or another, if this goes too far, we will have an unbalanced situation. Sorry, that is just mm -hmm. a footnote and not in reply to your question. Uh, I think the biggest problem with which African leaders and the developing world leaders have to deal is really the problem of poverty. And the how to overcome the problem of poverty, to, to set the, their countries on the road to economic growth, is a fundamental problem with which all leaders are struggling. If a big percentage of your population is illiterate, if a very big percentage of your population is untrained, unskilled, or semi-skilled, how do you enter the new world and the globalized village? <clears throat> that switches then to management of education and health, the practical issues, the results of poverty, the results of illiteracy, that is where I think with the youth, where the, uh, the improvement should start. A problem cutting across almost all borders in Africa is the problem of uh, corruption. And once again, a survey has been made, I forgot the name of the institution now, which has clearly shown that the more prosperous a society is, the less corruption there is. The poorer a society is, the more corruption there is. <clears throat> the figure, for instance, comparative figures for Africa itself shows that in South Africa, the percentage of people who say that they have been involved in corrupt practices by offering bribes or whatever, is dramatically lower than in the poorer countries in the rest of Africa. So corruption and the fight against corruption and how to, 
how to manage corruption, how to bring it down, is an issue with which all le leaders are struggling. And the last category that we find in our interaction with some of the countries that we are involved in in the Global Leadership Foundation lies in the constitutional field. Mm. Lies in how to, if you say I want to democratize, how to democratize within the framework of not having a long history of democracy. How to democratize within the framework of not having a tradition of having political parties. And uh, I'm a firm believer that, that no specific form of democracy is the absolute prime form and this is, the, this is democracy and anything which is not exactly the same is not good democracy. I think we should allow countries without a democratic history to develop their own form of democracy which fits in with their culture and all their religion. But constitutional advice on constitutional issues, on economic issues, and on uh, intergroup relationships form most mm. of our activities. Okay. okay, we'll open it to questions. Uh, also, let me remind you to ask a question and not make a statement. Uh, so we'll begin here. Wait for the microphone. It's coming behind you. I'm Timothy Towell, a retired U.S. diplomat. Mr. President, it's an honor to have you here. We can now see why you got a Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> I was fascinated by what you said about the split in the ANC. You said, quote, not bad for democracy, and then if they drop below two-thirds, it's probably good for the system. You built that country with a great, unique statesman, Nelson Mandela. You've had two presidents since who perhaps have not been up to his standard. You now have a president who's not the president of the ANC. The head of the ANC, as you well know, is a Zulu warrior whose personal life is in the newspaper every day, who's got legal cases against him, who's a tough guy. Some people say that's awful. That's going down the drain. That's not good for democracy. Others, interesting folks, Say, we need a guy at this point in history who's tough, who's mean, who looks like an old Chicago or Boston mayor, who can take problems head on and not waffle, and can even go up to Zimbabwe and get in uh, uh, what's it, Mugabe's face. What's your response to that construct, sir? Thank you. Uh, let's take uh, one more right in front here while we're in front. <laughs> Uh, my name is Aduotu. I'm an independent journalist. Um, I would like, uh, given your proximity to Zimbabwe, could you comment on uh, the current uh, political arrangement? That gives you enough meat for the first answer, yeah. and there's a Zimbabwe connection there. <laughs> so let me say, I, I really would like to steer away from being ad hominem from analyzing uh, Mr. Zuma, who is president of the ANC, or Mr. Motlantle, who is now the interim president, awaiting the election, or maybe awaiting the outcome of the court procedures, I would rather like to address the issue in principle. Any country, the electorate gets the leaders they elect, and then they deserve the leaders they elect. That is what democracy is all about. And leaders quite often really only show their real mettle when they put to the test and get into executive positions. So as far as the whole leadership situation in the ANC is concerned, I think the principles involved is it's not good for any country to have a president with a cloud over his head. That's for me a principle. I would have preferred if the ANC wants to make Mr. Zuma president that he should have been cleared by a court and that there should be no pending court actions against him with regard to the allegations of corrupt practices. That I think would be the healthy thing for South Africa and its democracy. Uh, if Mr. Zuma was here, let me just say, you, you spoke a bit about him. 
he would have charmed this audience tremendously. He's also a nice and a very friendly and a warm man. <laughs> He's not just this tough guy that you described. Uh, and uh, he has quite a capacity to impress audiences. Uh, Zimbabwe. I sincerely hope that this, I would like to say, almost enforced government of national unity will succeed. Uh, because what has happened and is happening in Zimbabwe is a tragedy. It was a well-run country until about 10 years ago. It was called the basket, food basket of Southern Africa. It was a highly favored tourist destination for many. At the moment, more than half of its people is in neighboring countries. Those who are in Zimbabwe cannot make a living. They have a cholera epidemic because of bad management. Zimbabwe has imploded. It's a tragedy. It needs strong leadership now. Whether with the way in which the government of national unity came into being, whether that will ensure a focused, cooperative national of gov uh, uh, government of national unity, I have my doubts. And I'm, I'm deeply concerned, but if against, I, would, I wouldn't be wrong to say, if against expectations they succeed, all of us who are a bit skeptical about the chances for success will say, we are so glad that we were wrong. Okay, thank you. Let's take a couple more questions. Let's move to uh, this side of the room for the first one. Uh, thank you. Welcome, Mr. President. Uh, Tim Carney, also a retired U.S. diplomat. <laughs> I'd first of all like to extend condolences uh, to you and all South Africans at the loss of Helen Sussman last month. And my question is, do you, sir, you believe that a growing black middle class in South Africa can restrict and limit the left wing of the ANC in its views about a continuing national democratic revolution. Okay, I recognize a hand right in the center here. If we can get the microphone to her. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, I'm Nozi Pombanjo from Umlambo Foundation in Johannesburg. I have just two quick questions. The first one is, what has the reception been of the Global Leadership Foundation domestically, given the current government, and also in Southern Africa? Of course, then again, keeping in mind Zimbabwe. And the second question is, um, touches on your comments about NEPAD. Given the recall of uh, President Mbeki, what do you think the future of NEPAD is now? Thank you. Thank okay. you. I think I can deal with those. Well, let, let, me, let me firstly say that the short answer to your question is yes. Yes, I think a growing black middle class can be a stabilizing factor and can thwart any plans which the extremists on the left wing of the ANC might have in the backs of their head with regard to their interpretation of the National Democratic Revolution. I also know that the black middle class is growing fastly. So things are really moving in the right direction. I'm convinced that the overwhelming majority of all South Africans are moderate, would not like to see extremists from either the left or the right in our total society uh, get hold of, of power, would like to see moderation survive. Of course, the most difficult body of people to motivate and to mobilize are the moderates, because they are moderate and therefore it's difficult to get them to move. But I really think the 
socio-economic development in South Africa is moving towards the strengthening of the middle ground and the strengthening of the middle class, if you look at classes economically speaking. But apart from that, the biggest challenge, not, not to thwart the left wing, but the biggest challenge from a humanitarian point of view for any leadership, any leader in South Africa, for any institution in South Africa, and specifically for any government in South Africa, is to bring that percentage of people who live on or beneath the breadline down dramatically and to create a socio-economic situation in which the middle class will grow much faster than it is growing at the moment. <clears throat> as far as those two questions are concerned, uh, just refresh my memory by two words. Uh, the Global uh, Leadership Foundation domestically and How is that accepted? And the second and, one? Uh, NEPAD. NEPAD. As far as the acceptance of the Global Leadership Foundation is concerned, yes, I think there is by acceptance in the leading countries that there is a need for private and a niche for private diplomacy, if I can call it that. I haven't had time to brief the new administration yet. I have briefed Colin Powell when he was Secretary of State. I've briefed Condoleezza Rice, and I am awaiting the opportunity to also brief uh, Mrs. Hillary Clinton. Uh, we are doing likewise with the foreign affairs departments of some other leading countries. We are regularly briefing the World Bank, the IMF, the United Nations, the European Union, and other organizations active in the same field, such as the Red Cross, such as the International uh, Crisis Center in, in Brussels, and a number of other organizations we have developed a network with, we part of a network in that regard, and there's been great acceptance and, uh, and moral support for what we're doing. We don't take government money because then we might be accused of representing specific government interests. We might take financial support from truly innocuous governments who uh, don't threaten anybody and who has a big record of being active in a constructive sen uh, uh, sense of the word, but we, we won't accept financial support from, from any government which is playing a crucial role in the international uh, politics. Uh, as far as uh, NAPAD is concerned, it is my hope that the African Union will continue with it. It wasn't only President Mbeki. He was one of the three or four driving forces in setting it up. But I'm convinced that uh, it's such a good idea that those who are still in leadership positions, who believed in it, and newcomers, will also embrace this concept and will further continue to expand it and to intensify their efforts in that regard. Thank you. Uh, let's get one from the back, all the way back there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Um, Lawrence Freeman from Executive Intelligence Review on Africa. Uh, good to hear you speak, uh, President de Klerk. Uh, the question of poverty you brought up a couple of times in your remarks, and I'd like to draw you out on that. I think the meltdown of the financial system proves that globalization hasn't worked. And inside South Africa, I think there is a real danger of growing poverty and the collapsing of infrastructure, and I'm very concerned about the withdrawal possibility of nuclear power in South Africa. I, from what I can see from the ANC manifesto and the COPE manifesto, I don't see how they're going to address this question of economic uh, poverty growing. And it seems to me, my perspective is, has to be massive public investment in infrastructure as a way to put people to work and to add value to the economy. So I'd like to know what you think should be done to actually achieve economic growth in the midst of this economic collapse. Okay. <coughs> one in the center here. Mm -hmm. 
My name is Deirdre Lupin. I'm a fellow here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, Mr. President, no one would disagree with your assessment that poverty and tackling poverty is probably a primary priority for Africa. But as we saw in neighboring Zimbabwe, the best laid economic and development plans can be scuttled very quickly by bad politics. How do you think that the tragedy, as you've described Zimbabwe to be, could be avoided in future? How could SADC or the AU or the international community be mobilized to prevent such a future tragedy? Well, the two questions really are related to, to a certain extent. Your question focuses, the first question focuses on South Africa. As a matter of fact, South Africa is expanding on a massive infrastructural development program with regard to maintenance and repairs, but also with regard to new roads, new dams, new power stations, uh, which will has as a result massive job creation. I think job creation is a starting point for any country which wants to move out of poverty is train people for the jobs and create the jobs. So therefore, there is also an acknowledgement, also by the governing party, that another aspect is professional training. The training system in South Africa, the apprenticeship system, where after basic schooling and so on, people were trained to become electricians, to become plumbers, to become uh, all sorts of practical uh, people working in factories and the like has unfortunately been neglected. This is being revived at the moment. And there's also an acceptance that there's a fundamental need to improve the quality, the quality of our education. We already spend about 20% of our total budget on education. And there's consensus that it's not a question of throwing more money at education. It's a question of improving the standards of education and that a starting point should be and schemes are now being developed which I support a starting point should be training and retraining of principals of schools so that we will have better leadership in the school so that there will be greater discipline with regard to the teachers and greater motivation of the teachers so our education system is going to be revamped, basically. I think, therefore, that our economic development plan, the focus is also being put on development. Our economic development plan is basically in place, and if it is implemented properly, uh, will avert the negative possibility that you mentioned of us sliding further and further back and poverty actually growing in South Africa. I'm really an optimist in this regard. I think we pointed in the right direction. And if there's proper implementation, we're going to present the 2010 World Cup, which will be a big success. And much of the infrastructural development is also focused on ensuring that. So uh, we are not downcast in South Africa about the economy at the moment. We're not buoyant. We are worried about what the effect of what is happening internationally will exactly be. But generally speaking, we have good plans in place to avoid what you predict might be a possibility and to ensure this growth of the middle class and this bringing down of the percentage of the people who are really suffering. Uh, uh, just to refresh my memory, you, your question related also to poverty. How to avoid Zimbabwe's in the future. And, and, and how, to, how to avoid a downward spiral such as you saw in Zimbabwe. In other countries. In bad politics. And how can the international or or AU community uh, intervene? Well, let me firstly say I... I don't think the intervention by uh, 
other countries can be on the basis of deciding who will be the leader in that country. So other countries, SADC and the African Union and the USA and the European Union have to deal with the leaders who are the leaders. So the only real root of, of influencing decisions and the way things are going in a particular country lies to my mind in a few areas. Firstly, where pressure is needed by pressure, but constructive pressure. Secondly, by investment and project oriented aid which to which proper conditionalities are attached in order to ensure that the money is used for the purpose for which it is given thirdly by taking hands with civil society because civil society is doing very good work in africa if you look at the work that the Gates Foundation, for instance, is doing in the field of health and education, it is remarkable. And a partnership between countries uh, who are affected, countries who are indirectly affected because things are going wrong in their neighboring country, and the leading countries of the world, which has a moral responsibility to be involved, partnership between them and civil society, I think, is also of great importance. Uh, if things really go wrong, if, if, you, if the international community or if SADC sees a country starting to slide into becoming a failed country, I think they should have early warning systems and shouldn't wait for the crisis. The emphasis should be rather on prevention than on reaction to a crisis, prevention of the crisis. And maybe if there has been in Zimbabwe <clears throat> earlier intervention within the framework that I've now described, things might have gone somewhat different. But things were allowed to slide into this tragedy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> question right here on the edge, and then one more back here somewhere. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Nouradine Sati. I'm a senior fellow at Woodrow Wilson. Um, uh, Mr. President, um, could you please e elaborate on um, your concerns concerning the primary uh, rights and the secondary rights, uh, particularly in relation to affirmative uh, you know, um, and, and uh, the issue that you mentioned concerning the, the, the economic uh, rights, uh, the black economic right, emp empowerment. Um, the second question is concerning the role of South Africa uh, in Africa that you mentioned. Uh, what role can South Africa play in the future uh, in the construction, uh, of the regional construction, but particularly the, the concept of the government of the Union, which is being discussed now in the African Union? Thank you. Okay, let's take one more. To, okay. uh, Mr. President, <coughs> my name is Howard Wiarda. You'll recognize that as a Dutch name, but I am Dutch-American, not Dutch-Dutch or uh, Afrikaner-Dutch, just to make some <laughs> distinctions. Um, would you comment, please, on the issue of, um, of white flight, as it's called, in South Africa? Uh, in my experience there, um, middle class and uh, not very well educated whites have over the last uh, 10 years or so not seen a very bright future for themselves in South Africa and often saw the jobs as limited to either uh, security, which is a, a booming industry as you know, uh, or to uh, uh, game guides and, uh, and natural preserve guides. And among young people in the university, who love their country and its, its beautiful uh, features, but worry about their own futures as well, uh, there, there was great torn sentiment about whether to stay or whether to try to find a life somewhere else. 
Could you please comment on this issue and its implications for the future of the country? Thank you. What was the second question? Well, I don't remember the, uh, the second one. question was uh, South Africa in Africa and governance. And oh, yeah. As far as the, the primary and the secondary situation in the Constitution, the, the movement towards trying to elevate some of the rights as being more important than others is concerned. <clears throat> Let me start by saying, if you analyze the Constitution, it is a compromise, as I've said. A compromise where, through give and take, the two main role players in the negotiations and the other parties, because we had all inclusive negotiations, through give and take, agreed upon an historic compromise. Now, for the ANC and what they represented in the negotiations, rectification of the wrongs of the past was fundamentally important. We accepted it. I made a profound apology for the pain and the harm and the damage that apartheid has done to the dignity and the lifestyle and the quality of life and the basic human rights of the people who have been hurt by it. So we had no problem in accepting that principle. On the other hand, from what we represented was fundamentally important, the protection of justifiable vested rights to prevent what has happened in Zimbabwe. If we just look what, how Zimbabwe handled the land issue. So it's very important that there should be a clause for, to protect legally acquired private property ownership. That does not e exclude land reform. But... Land reform must therefore constitutionally take place within the framework of recognizing vested rights, of if there are good reasons for expropriation, of proper compensation for such vested rights, and for the role of independent courts in that process of adjudication when the government does enter into the process of expropriation, that it should be fair. I'm using a different example now. Recently, the ANC tabled a bill which would have basically undermined, because they frustrated, they're not making sufficient headway, I say through bad administration and through wrong policy choices, but they're not making sufficient progress with land reform. Now they get frustrated. Now they bring a bill which would really undermine the effective protection of private property ownership. My foundation in South Africa, the Center for Constitutional Rights, led the charge, brought together a, a coalition of of civil society organizations. And I lift my hat. The ANC listened and had open ears and withdrew that bill as a result of the public outcry which came about. But if we were sitting on our hands and if we were not being watchful, that bill might have become law and would have actually fundamentally amended the Constitution by stealth. So that is what I mean where it is necessary to balance. Affirmative action. The unbalanced way in which it has been implemented has resulted in the loss of so many experienced people in the civil service, in the police, in all the public services, at municipal level, that actually... Uh, there is a vacuum of experience in management at the moment in public institutions and in the civil service. The ANC now realizes it. I, I am heartened by what I hear from them with regard to the need to return to South Africa 
We have such a shortage of engineers, of chartered accountants, of in, in many fields. So, and this brings me to this other question of the other gentleman. Affirmative action was one of the contributing factors to so many experienced, highly trained people leaving South Africa. And this has resulted in a great shortage of high-tech, highly qualified people in South Africa, which harms the economy, while we have an oversupply of skilled and unskilled labor. And the positive is the, the pendulum is swinging towards a more balanced approach now to affirmative action and to, I think, black economic empowerment. We'll have to see what the new administration, when it's elected, will now do in that regard, but uh, it is a fundamental problem with which we're continuously struggling with. Uh, let me finish then with the question of the flight of so many white people. Yes, a shocking percentage of white South Africans, but it's not only white South Africans, but a shocking percentage of white South Africans have left. Some put it at around 20%. If you analyze that group, not all of them are emigrants. A big percentage of them intend to return to South Africa. Why did they leave? They left, some of them, because of affirmative action. Parents don't see a future. They would have liked their children to go into the civil service or whatever. They don't see a future, and therefore... They go to New Zealand or Australia or Canada or whatever. Second factor is inefficiency with regard to crime fighting in South Africa, which is related to affirmative action because too many experienced detectives, etc., were given early retirement and the police force has been weakened in the sense of a loss of experience. Once again, the tide is turning. It's the one issue where the Mbeki government actually failed and where the new administration is promising a total revision of the justice system, including major strengthening of the police force, good training of the police force, and a more effective uh, crime-fighting action plan, which will hopefully also change that tide. But many of them have left just because we're back in the new, in the international community. Just because young people can, can go and work for three years in London and explore other, or in America or wherever, and explore other horizons. And during a period when the rent was very weak, they would earn through dollars or pounds or euros or whatever, much more than they could earn in South Africa, pay off their study debts, etc., etc., for pragmatic reasons, they go. There is a tendency now with the economic situation, which is developing, of a greater return of people to South Africa. But I believe the solution to stop the bleeding in that regard and to turn the tide and to get some of the experienced nurses and doctors and dentists and engineers and chartered accountants back into South Africa lies in the leadership in South Africa making a concerted effort to move away from a new form of racial discrimination and to make all South Africans and all minorities feel that they are wanted, that they are needed, that they are appreciated, and that they have a good future in that country. It is my hope that with the new turns in the party political system, there will be a greater realization of this need and greater emphasis to achieve that. Then the last question referred to South Africa's role in Africa again. Mm. Well, South Africa's role in Africa, I think, uh, is dictated by its economic strength, by 
the modernization which has brought it very near to becoming part of fully part of the first world, if I can call that. I don't like the first third world distinction, but let me use it just for the sake of brevity. But South Africa is very careful not to play that role in a prescriptive manner. And therefore, I foresee that South Africa will, will constantly try to reach out and, and, and promote the partnership concept. As they've done when there were big problems in Lesotho, which is a small state, to the extent that the African Union decided military intervention is necessary. South Africa could have done it in 24 hours, but they didn't do it alone. They brought Botswana in and so on, and so that it was a multi-country uh, force and uh, a task force and not the South African army. I don't subscribe to the concept of the African Union uh, being transformed into something like the European Union is now. I... If, if Europe can't become a federal state, which I think it will not do, although there are the federalists who want to have a European president and, 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 and really take away many of the powers which uh, the constituent members of the European Union have, if they can't do it, then I'm convinced Africa cannot do it. And I think it's, it's really pie in the sky, and I don't think it's healthy either. I, I don't believe that peace and prosperity will be promoted by putting pressure on the sense of national pride of different countries and their nations. Once again, I believe balance is the answer. Yes, we should strengthen as a departure point regional cooperation. SADC is quite dysfunction, dysfunctional. SADC should, should be uh, revitalized and should be streamlined. And, and SADC as a region for the 11 most southernmost countries in Africa should, should be made into a prime example for what inter-regional cooperation can achieve. And yes, you might, if all the members are stabilized and so on. You might have a situation of the RAND becoming, maybe with a new name, the monetary unit for the whole of the SADC, all the SADC countries, that sort of thing. There should be, therefore, to my mind, a gradual step-by-step -step process which should start at regional level. And if I were a president or whatever of America or prime minister of England or the president of France, I would, in looking at Africa, look at regions. And I would attach value to the influence that stable countries have within a region. And I would, therefore, in southern Africa, identify the one or two or three most democratic most stable countries, and the same in East Africa, and the same in Central Africa, and the same in West Africa. And then I would help those countries to become the, the pivotal point around which the whole region can develop as a region, something like that. That is what, what I mean when I say there's a need for a cohesive approach towards the problems of Africa. I'm not saying my model is the right model. But is there a model? I don't think so. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'm afraid we've run over our time now, so we can't take any more questions. Before we uh, thank uh, President Declerc, though, uh, let me ask you all to remain seated for a few moments while the President departs so he can get out of the building quickly and take care of the security problems. Uh, so thank you very thank much, you. President Declerc.